All righty, guys. I am here on behalf of Kaiji United with Donnie Winter. Donnie is a author, poet, professor, Kaiju fan, all the above. Uh, Donnie, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Well, I mean, that was a great introduction. I think that that pretty much sums it up. I basically do a lot, and <laughs> I, I've i been in the Kaiju fandom for a long time, ever since the message boards way back in, like, 2003, and since then, I've been just, I, I developed as, like, a fan fiction writer into an actual, like, poet, now YouTuber, but also I teach writing, and I... I there's just a lot. There's just a lot. But somehow it all comes together in very mysterious ways. So <laughs> I was I was going to open with that. I was going to ask you if your relationship with the kaiju genre and your academic career stay separate or do they kind of mesh together? Because like creative writing kind of does that sometimes with your life. Well, like kai like the kaiju like influence is definitely present in my own writing. But like when I have people ask me, like, let's pretend I'm like with other faculty or writers in like academia, they'll ask me, well, how did you first start writing? Because that's always like the prime question, right? And I always tell them without skipping a beat, writing Godzilla fan fiction. I developed my love of writing through fan fiction because it helped me escape, create a world of my own. And because people tend to be overly critical about fan fiction as being like people's, you know, introduction to writing, like I'm always like, hey, don't knock on people who love fan fiction because for many of them, that shapes who they are and it can influence the trajectory of their careers, especially if they go into writing of any variety. So. I like that because I do know that fanfic gets a knock sometimes. I never got into it just because I was more on the uh, videography side of things. I liked filming like micro movies with my toys and stuff. But um, I'm glad that there's an open positivity conversation about fanfic because it's it's something that has it's existed on almost every kaiju site. Um, oh, absolutely. We don't, we don't have it right now, but that's. That's besides the point here. <laughs> so my my favorite fanfic that really set things in motion for me was C.L. Werner's Kamajutsu, The Coming of Back Began, uh, that was on Kaiju File so many years ago. And I was just, it's such a good story. And I was, I, I read that and I was like, I can write Godzilla fan fiction. And then it took off from there and I created my own series. Uh one of my best friends I met on Kaiju File as well, and um, her name is Cindy, also a very talented fan fiction writer. And we literally spent like our youths like workshopping each other's fanfics and giving each other feedback and collaborating. It's su such a fun experience. But I love that you mentioned um, you mentioned videography because if let me share a cringy story with you. So in my old fanfics. I wanted myself and all of my friends to be in the fanfics. So I put us all in. I, I created characters. I I didn't even change the name. Like the, the utter sheer teenage vanity of it was terrible. So at, like once I would get into like these stories, um, I would like get with my friends and record like music videos and scenes. <laughs> And they were so cringy. Like, I, like I just found them probably a couple of weeks ago, and I was watching them, and I'm just like, "What was I doing? <laughs> what was I thinking? What was wrong with me?" But they're so delightfully nostalgic. I can't get over it. You don't have to share it with the Kaiji United folks, but can I see one of those? Uh, I will uh, definitely. Off the table. I'll definitely send you one of them, and you will be very <laughs> amused by the. How it's very 2000s, let's just say the transitions, I, all of it. <laughs> I was born in '98, and uh, my catchphrase on doing these interviews is "I'll carbon date myself." <laughs> um, so I, I felt that 2000s ish a little bit. It's definitely what I'm a little more nostalgic for instead of uh, the 2010s because uh, I don't know, I just love the. The Limp Biscuit. I love the oh, Evanescence. My Evanescence. My favorite band ever. I'm fairly sure I have old 
music videos for fanfics to the to Evanescence's entire discography. Um, but I, I remember when I would write fan fiction, I would also like design like a soundtrack to my fanfic. <laughs> Very angsty. I love it. I do playlists for when I um off the cusp, I do screenplays and I want to make movies. I make playlists for the stuff I write in screenplays. Mm, so I love it's that. definitely not out of the norm. And I think more people should do that because music can help you uh atmospherize. Is that a word? The scene it is now. Well it, yeah, it, it, is it now. helps <laughs> well, it helps create that creative space for you. Like even to this day, like if I'm working on a collection of poems, like I will I will create like a playlist of music on YouTube or, you know, Amazon music or whatever that, you know, helps get me focused and in the mood for whatever scene I'm writing or poem I'm writing, etc. So it's necessary, I think. Um, with your writing, we, we've gone over that you've started uh, with Godzilla fan fiction, but as a professional published writer, how has that um, A, affected and B, um, influenced your trajectory writing etc well that i mean that's a great question thank you for that question i i've always loved poetry like i've written poetry for almost as long as i've written uh godzilla fan fiction of course my old poetry which is commonly known as our juvenilia is very cringy and terrible and like myspace poetry and then of course once i took classes got degrees and started like workshopping and getting better at my craft like that's when i discovered that i really wanted to move in the direction of getting a body of work published so in about like 2009 i took a couple of uh well i double majored in creative writing and anthropology so like i took some like creative writing classes i started developing a little bit of work and then like i did a master's program I flesh it out into like a manuscript. And then I sat on it for years. I really didn't do much of anything with it until the pandemic. I, I The pandemic came and I was like, you know, I have all this time in the world right now. What better time to work on putting together a collection of poems than now, right? So it's kind of like my way of getting through the pandemic. And that's where Carbon Footprint came from. That's This is my, my first poem collection. But so... Um, now, Godzilla still maintains an influence on all of my work, even my poetry, because I, as I've grown, like, I eventually came out as an LGBTQ plus person, and Godzilla for a long time was kind of my escape and kind of my go-to when it came to needing some inspiration of perseverance and survival. So, like, I would watch Godzilla films and be like, you know, wow, Godzilla, Godzilla's defeating this enemy who is like twice as huge as him and way more powerful like i can go to school and deal with these bullies who are treating me terribly and and navigate that space right so like my first collection carbon footprint like that kind of like that influence is there because i kind of use godzilla as an extended metaphor throughout it um for that means of escape for me you know and uh, throughout my other collections, Godzilla's influence in the work has also shifted a bit, but, you know, it's still there. It's still there. Interesting. Have you ever, um, maybe not in the books, but just um, later on in your career, have you written a poem about or like um, situationally about uh, Godzilla, maybe like the character or just like going back and watching the films? Uh, yes. Yeah. So in my second collection, Feats of Alchemy, this is this is uh, my collection, which kind of overviews my experiences post coming out, because I don't think that's a time in LGBTQ plus people's lives that, that are often talked about. So Godzilla became like a significant influence in this. And um, so there's like a lot of commentary in this book about like mental health, and, you know, developing like a sense of self in all of these different social circles that we are kind of thrust into, right? Especially as an LGBTQ plus person. And toward like the, I think it's the second section of the book, I, I was watching my annual Godzilla movie marathon and I started getting really obsessed with the mad scientist doctors. Um, so I was like, 
I'm going to write a series of poems about these mad scientist doctors and then connect them to my commentary about like post coming out, adapting to the world, etc. So there's probably, I think there's like four poems about four of the mad scientists throughout um, the Godzilla series. Dr. Sarazawa from, you know, Gojira. Uh, Dr. Mifune from uh, Terror of Mechagodzilla is another one that I wanted. Uh, Dr. Shiragami from Godzilla vs. Biollante, one of my favorite characters ever. And then last but not least, I wrote a poem about Dr. Yahara from uh, Godzilla against Mechagodzilla. <laughs> so, do you want to know how nerdy I am? I do. Because, because I knew that people buying my work wouldn't always know all these obscure, well, to them, obscure characters from Godzilla films, I was like, I'm going to put in footnotes. <laughs> yes. I'm going to put in footnotes and connect it to uh, the Godzilla films. So, but... To answer your question, yes. <laughs> I, I think that answered it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Was that, um, for human characters, I mean, those overall poems about mad scientists, human characters and whatnot, um, is that kind of how you show your love for those human characters? Um, and then you kind of focus more on, uh, I would say, like you expressed with Godzilla, he more taught you to, you know, stand up and fight and stuff. Is that kind of where human characters come along with your relationship? I would say so. Um, like, honestly, I, I kind of looked at the characters and their roles in their respective films. And I thought about, like, the themes and dynamics associated with them. And then, like, when you think about it, like, many of them were othered in some way. They were trying to do what they thought was best for their child, for humanity. Many of them were tragic characters. And, you know, as an LGBTQ plus person, I often felt like I had to sacrifice important things. And I, so like, I really resonated with that sense of like sacrificing parts of yourself for the comfort of other people or the betterment of other people. So that's, I would say that's where the poems helped me feel a little bit more connected with the characters a bit. And I think developed, helped me develop a stronger appreciation for them too. Because I really don't think we as Godzilla fans celebrate the human characters as much as we should. Uh, so like my goal with this collection notably and then these poems was to help celebrate those characters because I feel like they deserve it, right? I love it. That's that's really loaded. Wow. <laughs> I was like, I was, I was going to be like, yeah, I like the human characters. Um, and they're really important to the series. I really personally dislike it when people are like, oh, I only watch it for the monster bashing. I don't care about the people. When, I mean, especially with this hero Honda's films, um, they're very humanistic. Absolutely. Um, he's, he's a peace-loving, anti-war man. Like, you, you just... His characters reflect that, especially uh, Buffune and uh, Terra Mechagodzilla. Just uh, the stuff that, I mean, I personally, this could be speculation, um, don't come after me, experts, <laughs> but uh, I think that's reflective of Honda, and unfortunately we have to have this conversation. Honda was forced to run pleasure camps in World War II, um, for those of you that don't know what that is, um, I would probably inquire you to ask a historian, but the name kind of sells itself. It's, um, I'm going to say this as delicately as I can, uh, basically um, prostitution camps for soldiers, and you have to run it and serve the empire or you're toast. So I don't know. I think... Uh, on that side of things, I think that oozed itself into Honda's characters, and we can get a lot from that, you know, being forced to change for everyone else just to keep well, the system stabilized, you know. And having these powers dictate to us what parts of ourselves we should compromise and sacrifice in order to fit their definition of of representation, of action, of a whole variety of different things, right? Yeah, absolutely. 
It got it got a little dark there, but um, I I think it's just an important <laughs> conversation. It is have. well, like again, like that darkness, like because like I've when talking about my collection feats of alchemy, I have to have that conversation a lot too because in order to get to the other side of that darkness, you have to address it and acknowledge it and and navigate through that trauma sometimes like that's not a linear process it can be very inconsistent right mm -hmm. and um if there's anything that i've learned in my own life it's that navigating trauma is definitely not a linear process and if if what we create can reflect that but also serve as some cathartic release for us that's what makes it significant and I'll remind you guys that a lot of that stemmed from Godzilla fan fiction, especially from Donnie. So that's another way to sell that fan fiction, not just being, um, I guess I'll generalize here a little bit. I don't feel this way personally, but uh, a lot of people feel like fan fiction is just smut and it, that's just right. not the case. And and mind you, like there there is a place in the fan fiction world for smut as well. Um I like I always have been that person that's viewed fan fiction as a way for us to escape into the universes we love, but also be enriched by our universes through adding to them, through expanding on them. And I think that that's what makes fan fiction significant. It gives us that power to, you know, have some sort of active participation in the universes slash franchises that we love. As an academic, Donnie, um, I did want to pose that I also had this discussion with some other writers. I'd like to say nothing's original. Like, if you boil stuff down, Lord of the Rings is Bible fanfic. Yeah. Um, then I love of, it. A lot of guys write fan fiction on Greek mythology, and it turns into other stories. I mean, at the end of the day, aren't we all writing fan fiction here? Well, so I, whenever I hear someone complain about originality, I get annoyed because the truth is, I think originality is this, like this manufactured idea that, you know, people aren't inspired by things. So that's how they like, no, we are influenced and inspired by everything around us, whether we're conscious of it or not. And that influences our work. So I don't really see it as, you know, necessarily carbon copying something else it's literally you know creating our own interpretation of something or using our own life histories or experiences to create a story but keeping in mind things that we've seen and celebrated in the past right i totally agree um i'm gonna ask a question for the younger guys <clears throat> excuse me uh we mentioned kaiju file a lot um, I'm going to just be point blank. What's kaiju file? I mean, I know what it is, but well, so before social media, uh, a lot of Godzilla fans would flock to message boards across the internet, and that's where they would engage with other kaiju fans, connect, write, and post fan fiction, discuss the films, have tournaments, so many different things. Kaiju file was one of those uh forums, uh, it's originally a part of a site called Rodan's Roost. Uh, and that's where a lot of people would go to, you know, have conversations about Godzilla. Other places, Toho Kingdom, uh, that's one that still exists, like that forum still exists and is still pretty active. Uh, let's see, uh, Monster Zero was one. Oh, I remember Monster Zero. Monster Zero. I, like, I ended up creating one in the mid 2000s called Kaiju Galaxy, which still exists. And, I I wanted Wait. to create my own community a long time ago because I was just like, people are fighting too much in these other places. So I'm going to make my own. And it worked. So sounds, sounds like kind of what I did. <laughs> right. Except you did it in a modernized way with social media. For me, it was back during the, you know, Bronze Age with, <laughs> with message boards. <laughs> but for many of us, that was our only access to news and conversation before social media. So it was a very interesting time, that's for sure. I didn't, I uh, personally, on a footnote here, I didn't know Donnie did Kaiju Galaxy. So that was a genuine reaction when he said that he did Kaiju Galaxy. I was like, wait, what? 
Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am the owner of Kaiju Galaxy, and I wanted it initially to be kind of like this oasis for like fan created works and stuff like that. And it was pretty, it was pretty popular for a long while until social media got more popular, you know, and, uh, you know, since most message boards have kind of become these surreal ghost towns of just these archived conversations that happened 15 years ago oh my gosh <laughs> right I, I i found a message board thread about like how to fix something from like 2002 and i was like it's like uh i guess it's like looking at ghosts because it know, is this discussion was typed out like this 20 years ago like where are they now i remember i remember spending hours and hours on places like kaiju file toho kingdom like kaiju galaxy of course like just writing fan fiction just for for so many hours and i like there's a certain nostalgic yearning that i have for those days again because i really miss them because like you could just lose yourself and whatever you were creating and it felt great um it totally. Um, I know that Kaiji United specifically is planning on dropping and debuting fan fiction by the end of the summer. We got Mitch Shuttleworth attached to deliver our first one. So that is the project for us specifically, not to plug Kaiji United here on a Kaiji United stream. Well, but... I would expect you to on your own <laughs> on your own thing, of course. Yeah, but this is about Donnie. But anyways, um, uh, we're going to add fanfic to the site and you know, it's not for everybody, but I am happy to provide that for the people like Donnie, like Mitchell that you know, really want to do it. This might be the motivating factor I need to, cause so like I've been, I've had this thought in my mind of going through and rewriting all of my cringy Godzilla fanfics. Cause like some of the premises and plots and characters were interesting but like because of the poor writing, the poor teenage writing, it was just not good. So I'm wanting to kind of like rewrite them with the writing capacity that I have now and re-upload them. So that, that I don't know, I might, I'm thinking about it now. Oh, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, before we transition into Donnie's show that I was just on a few weeks ago, um, I, I had another rando question that just you know, popped into my head. We um, we always look at, I mean, Donnie looked at Godzilla specifically as a stand-up and fight, and that is true. I mean, especially if you look at some of the uh, super formers, they're all smaller men that are, uh, and women, you know, Ryota, and um, the woman that played Gauss, I am blanking right now, I apologize. Um, but they're Thank always, you. like, um, they're always... I don't know exactly how tall they are, but I know like if you watch my interview with Kitagawa son, he's about to hear with me. And that's absolutely intentional. Like when I was talking to Ohashi son that played GMK Ghidorah, Gamera, they always want the smaller guys to play the protagon uh, protagonist monsters. And for the bigger dudes, you know, I'm kind of a bigger dude to play King Ghidorah or to play legion you know the big intimidating force villainous monster so it's really interesting that by design that's how it is just because small good guy overcoming goliath has always been a classic story but to take that further and say hey stand up for yourself is such a wonderful um, interpretation of that uh, another interpretation of, of godzilla for me that really especially as present in that second collection that I just mentioned, is how othered Godzilla is. Similar to those scientists. Those scientists were othered in a way. Godzilla is also like this anomalous creature, this, this abnormality, right? And often in many of the films is misunderstood by the humans. So like when, like thinking about that, like when I was a teenager, navigating my identity, etc. I connected to Godzilla on that front because I was like, you know, I'm feeling like I'm very misunderstood and misinterpreted by people too, right? Mm -hmm. Like people treated me like I was some sort of lumbering automaton destroying their perception of 
identity. And so like that, like I really bonded with Godzilla over that otherness. I was going to use that segue exactly what you said. Um, I find that there's a lot of queer creators, writers, et cetera, in not just Godzilla. And well, maybe not Godzilla. That's not the right thing to say there. But like uh, horror and monster movies in general, yeah. like uh, James Whale, the director of Bride of Frankenstein. and But uh, James Whale was a gay man, uh, point blank. There's no beating around the bush of that. Yeah. And if you watch Bride of Frankenstein, I think the modern lens examining that film is really interesting because you can see that he's kind of saying the same things about existing as the other, especially in 1931, 1935. Um, it just seems to be an interesting observation. Um, so it circulates around this metaphor of the monster, right? Mm -hmm. Like, or kaiju, right? strange beast, right? Like, like, what does that mean? What does that entail? What does that constitute? So like, I can only speak from the perspective of being a gay person, right? Mm -hmm. But like, as a gay person who had to deal with often being referred to as a monster of sorts, that kind of became like my own psychological go-to. And that's why like, I, I think that's one reason why I gravitated toward monsters so much. Like, like Godzilla being like that, like terrifying, horrifying, othered anomaly. Mothra being like the self-sacrificial, beautiful creature who I wanted to always be, but was always reduced to being Godzilla. Does this make sense? Like this? Kind yes. Of like dichotomy that's kind of what I was trying to ask. I was trying to say, do you think as like a gay man, do you feel a little bit, how James Whale may have felt, especially James Whale existing 70 years before us. I um, feel like I probably not now because mm -hmm. at that time, like this person had to lose himself in the metaphors in order to simply express himself. Right. We're mm -hmm. at a time now where like I can f freely be who I am. Like, don't get me wrong. We're totally. still navigating a lot of things. Right. Right. However, I'm still, I, I'm able to be myself and express myself, but looking at these like metaphors, these dichotomies of how we connect with like characters and, and creatures, that's an, an integral part to telling our histories and our stories, right? Mm -hmm. So like now I can reflect on those things from a safe vantage point, I think. Yeah. Interesting. I hope that answered your question. It totally did. I was just like, I am just so, um, I would just say interested. I was trying to think of a big, pretty word for that. But I was, I, I'm We're nerding fascinated. out. I'm nerding out. We're nerding out. <laughs> it's fascinating to me, especially because I'm, I'm kind of the, uh, I was going to say, I'm, I'm like the token cis male here of the kaiju fandom. I am pretty straight as it gets i am pretty white as it gets and i'm a dude so like i just really would like to use my kaiju united platform to hear these voices and listen to these stories that i may not experience in my lifetime period just because i exist differently you know what i mean yeah that well and that means a lot too like and that's similarly something that i strive to do with my own like work like my own like podcasts and stuff so like just being able to provide those platforms because the truth is like i think everyone's relationship with tokusatsu is their own right like based off from their own histories their experiences what they've been through like that's largely informed how they perceive these characters and films and dynamics and uh, for those of you that do not know, one of Donnie's shows is Growing Up with Godzilla, where they do just that. Um, I was just on it a few weeks ago. Um, Project Nautilus Cosplay is the newest episode. You can find them on Donnie's channel. You can find them on my site, our site, Kaiju United. You can find them anywhere. Um, I highly recommend. But it's, uh, I wanted to ask this, and I forgot to ask it on our episode. Where did it come from? Like, where, when did you decide to go, I'm going to talk to Kaiju fans about their upbringings? I've, like, I've always been very open about 
my own journey as a Godzilla fan and how that's shaped me as a person. So the beginnings started from like two places, I would say. Place number one, a few years ago, I kind of had like a video circulate infamously in the Godzilla fandom called Growing Up a Gay Godzilla Fan, where I basically shared many of the things I just shared, right? And it was well received by a lot of people, but like, of course, a lot of anti LGBTQ plus haters got a hold of it. And I started receiving death threats from Godzilla fans. It was kind of wild, right? Like, keep the gay out of my Godzilla. How dare you? You know, kind of a thing. And that was like, I re that was the point where I realized I was like, okay, like clearly there needs to be more conversation about this based on the reactions that are happening. Then, I was having a conversation, I think it was either a friend or a, a close friend or a family member where I was like talking about Godzilla, you know, and they were like, Donnie, you're in your thirties. When are you going to grow out of Godzilla? And I was just like, well, I haven't yet. So here we go. And that like, I kind of wanted to create growing up with Godzilla as a rebellion to those people who kind of criticize us for falling in love with the franchises that we love right and i think that a lot of godzilla fans can universally connect with that right absolutely so that's why i was like you know what fine i'm going to create a series where i not only share my own journey as a godzilla fan and you know what it's done for me but I want to also have conversations with other people to see, to learn about what their journeys have been like and to kind of immortalize those things in a certain way through the vastness of the interweb, because I think that that's empowering in a way. It is. And, and even if it's not your story, we all have some kind of, um, I would say received intake from the franchise, like, I mean, my closer in every interview I do with someone connected to Godzilla is, what does Godzilla mean to you? Um, Absolutely. When I talked to Graham Skipper, the author of Godzilla, the official guide that came to monsters, it was, um, he represents that art is malleable, and he is the perfect character to represent the malleability of art and just how Godzilla can kind of be anything you need it to be to serve the story. Absolutely. And it's interesting that you mentioned that because in a lot of um, my conversations with fellow Godzilla fans, especially those who are artists or writers or even podcasters, like that became a very common theme where like Godzilla became like this malleable metaphor for us to, to kind of, fill you know his meaning with you know to help us better understand ourselves the human experience i always tell people godzilla is more than just this lumbering beast destroying things godzilla is a socio-political commentary on the human experience and i think that that's significant and and it, it poetry is historically an examination of the human experience so for me Godzilla became that metaphor in my own work because like that otherness, that sense of being an anomaly, like that sense of being a monster, I have felt all of those things. So why not help people understand that perspective through writing about it, right? So Godzilla became a very convenient tool to use. And you're on season two of the show, I believe. Um, how's it how's it evolved from the uh, beginnings of that video that happened to catch the attention for better or worse of the community to kind of what it is now? Because I mean, you've had Matt Frank on the show. Um, oh. I'm not going to my own horn, but I've been on the show. Um, Two thousand. Nautilus, <laughs> Nautilus <laughs> cosplay has been on the show, Sean. Um, what's, I mean, how has it felt going from point A to point B in this journey with all these Godzilla fans just sitting down and talking to them? Right. 
so at the beginning, I only thought that Godzilla, the growing up with Godzilla was going to be like a one season, like 20 episode thing, right? I was, I was just going to like get some like friends together, sit down and have these conversations. And, and of course, like the, many of the people you mentioned, like I've been friends with for since the message board days, you know, like I've known Matt Frank since like DeviantArt <laughs> in like the mid 2000s. So I was just like, you know, like this is a great opportunity for us to get together and chat. But kind of like a few, like maybe four or five episodes into the first season, it started taking off. I started having people reaching out and wanting to participate, wanting to share their stories and experiences. And about midway through that first season, that's when I started, I was just like, okay, well, I got to do a second season. Um, and it started filling up and filling up and filling up. I managed to fill up this current season of growing up with Godzilla by the end of like January of this year, I like it's taken like this season's taken off so much that I'm already almost done planning season three for next year. Like it's, I I'm very warmed by the response because like I I've, I've dabbled in so many th like fan fiction writing um, like doing like reaction videos on YouTube, doing like these video essays on YouTube and like being able to find kind of like my little corner where I've been able to carve out something that to me is cathartic and enriching that I can also do with like people I care about dearly. Like that is so important to me. So I would say that it's taken off far more than I would have ever anticipated and I'm super grateful for that. And it's something I think personally, I mean, the big message of Kaiji United is like the community and then the importance of keeping that community. Not only that, but keeping a positive and uplifting community. Because yeah. um, there's a lot of, like I said in my episode, there's a lot of cynicism I've seen, a lot of negativity. Absolutely. It's just, I mean, we all like the same thing. We all come to the Godzilla movies because we all like them for different reasons. Yep. Can we just like get along? Absolutely. Like if if someone who is LGBTQ plus finds something in Godzilla that you may not immediately connect with, like that's no grounds to shame them. That's no threat to why you might like Godzilla, right? Like allow those people to have that, you know, connection. Maybe someone who, you know, is is neurodiverse, like maybe they connect with Godzilla on that wavelength. Like, who's to say anyone should be shamed for for that, right? So, like, I think that there's kind of, like, this instinct that a lot of people feel that they think that Godzilla is this one thing and only does this one thing for people, but that couldn't be further from the truth, right? I think that's, I mean, my... Uh feel expertise is movie monsters and i just feel like that's the entire point of movie monsters is however you feel misunderstood or as the other as you know the word you said um monsters kind of are that monsters are designed to be what society is afraid of and sometimes that's being different um yeah. or vocalizing yourself i just feel like that's that's movie monster 101. I mean, sometimes there's fun movie monsters like Cocaine Bear. Like, <laughs> you're not going to look at Cocaine Bear and be like, oh my God, I see myself in Cocaine Bear doing a lot of coke. Or Maybe. I don't know. Well, like, and the thing, like, a lot of people sometimes, like, I, I've been accused a few times in the past of, like, Donnie, you're overanalyzing everything. Stop overanalyzing everything. And the truth is, like, this is my area of expertise, like career wise. Like I know how to do literary analysis, etc. So like, that's my go-to. Like if I want to watch a Godzilla movie just for like leisure, like I can watch it and enjoy it without doing any deep dive analysis. If I don't want, like if I don't want to. Right. So like, it's like, it's not like I put on like this, this, terrifying mad scientist thinking cap whenever i watch a godzilla movie and i'm just like a computer brain being like "Ooh, these social connections right the no. is blue. right like it's not always that experience for me i can i can separate myself from that and enjoy godzilla but 
those experiences matter though. Like those, I think I personally feel that those sociopolitical commentaries are significant. I think, I think they matter. And I think personally, this is just my opinion. Um, I think it's important now more than ever right now, because I think whether it's just plugging your ears and ignorance or whatever it is, there seems to be a lack of media literacy right now. Everyone thinks that art and film have always been apolitical, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Um, I would even throw the opposing side out there. Don't tell me birth of a nation doesn't have sociopolitical commentary. Like Mm -hmm. what? Um, But I just think it's important to talk about what these films may mean or objectively mean. Cause I, you know, you can't really argue that any movie monster that isn't cocaine bear or (laughs) I don't know why I keep thinking of cocaine bear (laughs) or, just you know traditionalistic movie monsters are the other they're the uh, unaccepted they're the the terrors that we look at and whether that's the fear of the unknown with lovecraft um whether that's the clowns are scary as hell by stephen king whether that's um james whale like we talked about which i would love mm. to deep dive way more than we did um oh yeah yeah it's just uh, our innate fears as human beings and then we connect it back to Donnie with uh, the human experience uh, has fear in it. You're going to feel afraid of something. Yeah. Um, sometimes we're afraid of other things. Sometimes we're afraid of ourselves based on what other people think of us, right? That's why a lot of these monstrous poems came into being, right? Um, that's like why like in this in the collection I focused on, like, like there's a lot of like cyborg imagery, like in many ways, like I, 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 as well as many other LGBTQ plus people have felt like these, like, you know, half made automatons who are constantly trying to like create ourselves or recreate ourselves based on whatever we're navigating, whatever spaces we're navigating. So that's part of our human experience that we've had to deal with. Right. So I love it. Um, in regards to your show, um, you mean you can't? Uh, wow, I just screwed up. Um, <laughs> regarding your show, um, your plans, you don't have to give out your plans, is what I was trying to say. You don't have to like spoil everybody. But where's the future in uh, growing up with Godzilla? Like, obviously, season three is booked. Um, yes. I'm not even going to, I'm not going to be like a weird comic book.com kind of guy and be like, is season four confirmed? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, well, where's the future with it? Do you want to have like celebrity guests on there or are you keeping it more just people? Like, I think I'm keeping it more just people. Like if there's ever a point in the future where a celebrity guest does want to come on, like I would welcome them. Of course, obviously this isn't a situation where I can pay people to join me. This is like a, like we love the same thing let's chat about it kind of a scenario scenario mm-hmm. so but um i think that godzilla growing up with godzilla could go on for a while let's just say like i'm feeling very energized about it enriched about it i love it i think that growing up with godzilla could go on for quite a while and i i'm having a lot of fun and i know that others are having fun doing it too one thing that i would love for growing up with godzilla to have in the future is representation at conventions. Like I, this past year, I wanted to do like a panel for G Fest titled Growing Up with Godzilla, but that did not pan out because I missed the deadline and all of that jazz. And, you know, I'm not going to be at G Fest this year, unfortunately. Uh, But in the future, I would love to do like a panel where like we get some people together and then like have like an open mic where like maybe audience members can talk for like two to three minutes about their experiences, you know, something to that effect. I think it would be so enriching for people. Um, And it totally is. Um, I will speak from my experience doing panels for Salt Lake City Comic Con. You know, at one point it was the third biggest Comic Con behind New York and San Diego. Um, Just with those guys that may not be deep in the forest of the niche of Godzilla, 
we always have it interactive. We have a mic stand right in the middle of the audience where they can come up. We did uh, Godzilla's Rogues Gallery there, and that had about 120 people. And all they did was come up and just share their favorite bad guys from Godzilla and why they like the villains, you know, so much. Because a lot of villains are fun and memorable. But they are. I that's, think that's the beauty of these like conventions and comic cons. Like it brings people together. It it totally does. And you know, I think a growing up with Godzilla panel is genius. Um oh, thank you. Because it'll do the same thing. They'll come up and be like, you know, they might some of them from a specific age group might have the same story. You know, I went to the video store and rented it and the rest is history, but someone else might be like my, you know, my exposure to Godzilla was the PS4 game, and then I became a fan. You know, it's, absolutely, it's really great hearing all those stories. Yeah, and I think um, that people genuinely yeah. want to listen to those stories too, because that helps give them a sense of connection. Because I feel like, as Godzilla fans, and this is something that I think universally many of us can connect with. I think we all grew up feeling that sense of isolation in some way, right? Because we were always that one person in the friend group who liked Godzilla or people scoffed at us or parents were like, grow, grow out of liking giant dinosaur things. You know, and it's like, no, like, let us love our things. Come on. <laughs> but on the flip side, I'll, I'll use this platform to say, um, sometimes people come around on it. I know that I got a lot of shit in elementary and middle school for liking Godzilla being such a devoted, uh, passionate fan of the genre. And when Godzilla King of the Monsters came out by Legendary, a lot of some of the people that gave me crap for that went and saw it. And they posted on their Facebook that it was badass. And I was like, yeah. Now you it's see like, it? Where have you been? Where, where have you been, I, sis? You know, and, <laughs> Could have been a dick about it and could have been like, dude, you have no place seeing this movie. You gave me so much shit for it. But instead I went, you know, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you see what I see now. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, I, 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 yeah, I really am excited for the future of growing up with Godzilla. Um, I just, I think the panel is definitely the next step. And I well, hope and that happens. And for season four, like you're going to be returning for season or season three. I mean, you're going to be returning for season, season see, four. Confirmed. It's, Not quick. It's already sl subliminal in my head. Knocked out my head. <laughs> <laughs> Look what you've done, Jacob. I'm going to run an article and be like, "Hi, United." Uh, the season four confirmed. Donnie Winter. Not clickbait. <laughs> oh, the peer pressure. I love it. That's the good kind of peer pressure. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. But I'm excited. There's a future for it. Yes. And um, I'm excited for the possibility of a panel. Have you? I mean, I know we're both using StreamYard right now, not to give away the magician's secrets here. But uh, uh, what about virtual panels? Have you? Well, technically, the show is a virtual panel. Kind but of, like, yeah. Um, I've thought about doing like. So, like, I know when I get to, eventually when I get to episode 100 of Growing Up With Godzilla, I want to do, like, a Growing Up With Godzilla Live to celebrate it. Um, assuming I do get to episode 100, we're inching our way. In what direction. number are we on right now? We're on 33. Okay. We, well... we have a ways to go. <laughs> so that would be, like, if, if Growing Up With Godzilla goes, like, five seasons, then I think I'll have, like, 100 episodes. <laughs> um we'll see we'll see but i would love i wouldn't mind doing like virtual conventions or you know things like that too so like uh, people fun. calling in for a little bit and being like yeah i grew up with this this and this kind of thing yeah yeah i like it Hey, Donnie, uh, you were so inspired by poetry, and uh, Godzilla has influenced your poems so much. Would you like to read one of those for us? 
I, I, I was waiting for you to ask, like, of course. There's one specific poem I don't think I've ever really performed before that I want to read specifically for this. What's here? Uh, where, where is it? I need to find it. It's in Feats of Alchemy. Um, do, 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 do. This is one of my longer connection or uh, collections, so, like, I have to, like, look at my table of contents. <laughs> 86. So this poem is titled um, The Daikaiju Inside. And I think that this one kind of illustrates and captures what we've talked about today. Okay. The Daikaiju Inside. We've spent a lifetime locked away since high school spat us out like a nuclear spill into adulthood. After four long years stowed in the bowels of a reactor, we claw our way to the surface, dysfunctional, mangled, ready for the next meltdown. Now, some think me, a vengeful Ghidorah, born from solar storms, others see me as a pyroclastic spill, a volcanic Rodan erupting from the depths, though many Think I search to quench a Godzilla-sized hunger, a nomad destined to want wander. But after all these years, I've become Mothra, a guardian of his own home, a phoenix reborn from a torn body. The Staikaiju inside is a golem made alive, a storm destroyer with gossamer wings born from solar light. That was great. What a, what a what a what a cool thing to have on here you know we always have we've had filmmakers like i've had the director of that kaiju film the lake sit down with me i've had brendan sit down with me you know brendan yeah. um but i've never had a godzilla poem read um just for everyone to enjoy and i think that's wonderful and one of my goals in life is to like godzilla poetry is so cool i want to get more people into godzilla poetry <laughs> If you were listening to this, maybe write some of your own Godzilla poetry. And I will say, sometimes songwriting can be poetry. So, I mean, maybe read Blue Oyster Cult's lyrics to Godzilla. It kind of reads like a poem. Absolutely. 1,000%. All right, Donnie. Well, my uh, as I said earlier, my closing question is always, um, what does Godzilla mean to you? And uh, I, I will say that we kind of tackled that throughout the entire journey of this interview. But I will pose that to you if you want to kind of go into it a little deeper. So, like, for Donnie Winter, what does Godzilla mean to you? Godzilla means survival against all odds to me. And still does very much so to this day. And I think that more people than they're willing to admit might be able to relate with that. Godzilla is survival. Godzilla is that commentary on on human survival, especially. I like it. Mic what drops. and it's <laughs> some right? I was like, oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> um, one word. That's great. I love that you can describe your experience, your history, and your interpretation of Godzilla with just one word. I, I think that's fantastic. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> now, like, no, Jacob, though. thank you for having me on. This has been a great experience. Thank you for giving Growing Up with Godzilla an outlet, a, a space to be supported and, and dispersed. Like, that really means a lot to me, too. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on as a special guest for Kaiju United Interviews. It's, it's kind of cool that... I can go hop on somebody's show and podcast and then they'll come back and help me out a little bit. And I think that's really great for the community. That's kind of what, I mean, I've known David Scrivani of Talking Toku for many, 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 many years, but uh, what really sealed our bond was being able to get on Talking Toku and then him coming on and helping with the site. So I really think that that, um, back and forth is really networking cool. networking is networking. great <laughs> yeah and I'll, like i'll plug talking toku as well i'm going to be on an episode of theirs uh in the next couple of weeks so keep keep an eye out for that they're a phenomenal podcast and David kaiju and... united phenomenal site go check it out oh uh, thanks guys thank you donnie for coming on as a special guest donnie is a pro and a poet <laughs> and an author and 
a show host, talk show host. Uh, he's a man of all trades. So <laughs> it's uh, very exciting to sit down with Donnie Winter. So thank you, Donnie. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. <laughs>